Okay, so um, so my name's Tom Laredo. I'm an astronomer. I'm at Cornell University um, in the astronomy department, but with a joint appointment um, in statistics as a, a, a field lecturer and advisor of students and things. Um, and so what I wanted to tell you about today is um, hierarchical Bayesian modeling, which is playing an increasingly important role in astronomy. It's the focus of the current two-week workshop on exoplanets and stellar activity that's happening uh, mostly downstairs here this week and next. <clears throat> it's kind of the main background methodology behind a lot of different problems that people are addressing. And today I just wanted to tell you the very basics about it, so it'll be nothing new to the statisticians or to the two people who already heard <laughs> this talk. Um, so, uh, but just to um, establish the main ideas and terminology, only at the very end will there start to be a connection to as astronomy, where we talk about number counts, distributions in astronomy. Um, and so that's our agenda. And um, the first few slides are just a bit of a motivation about baseball. Now, I'm not at all a spectator sports person, but um, I did get my PhD in Chicago, so I am aware that there's lots of excitement about the Cubs. Um, <clears throat> I assume that hasn't changed. Was there bad news over the weekend or anything? No, they're still no, doing okay? <laughs> Whatever. No, anyway, so I'm not going to talk about the, the 2016 baseball season, but instead the 1970 baseball season. This is from a, famous, a set of famous papers, including one in Scientific American about this phenomenon. So um, two statisticians, Efren and Morris, you might recognize Efren, Brad Efren's name for, as the inventor of the bootstrap and former president of the ASA and, and so on, very famous contemporary statistician. They looked at the batting averages of baseball players who in May of 1970, early in the season, had 45 at-bats, which they considered to be large enough so that they could adopt some Gaussian approximations to the binomial distribution. Uh, um, among the players that they looked at, about a dozen or so, was Roberto Clemente, who even I recognize the name as a kind of outlier, very good baseball player. So um, <clears throat> the red dots here show the batting averages of those baseball players in those first 45 at-bats. Um, the blue dots show their batting averages at the end of the season, where they had a, a total of about 10 times that number of at-bats. So the viewpoint Efren and Morris took was that um, these full season averages are the true averages, the true performances, uh, uh, capabilities of the players. The red ones are noisy estimates of them, noisy because there's just a smaller sample. There's an assumption, reasonable or not, that their performance is constant through the season, but let's not worry about all that. All right, so um, these estimates are just what you would guess. Uh, little n is the number of hits, big N is the number of at-bats, so that's the maximum likelihood estimate from the binomial distribution. You know, there's a certain probability of uh, getting a hit. Um, if you have big N at-bats, there's a probability for getting little n. And uh, uh, if you maximize the likelihood function, the probability for getting little n hits and n at big n at bats, that the maximum, the, the most likely value of the probability of a hit is little n over big n. So that's where these uh, red dots come from. So the, the topic of their work was instead these green estimators. For these red ones, for each player, you just analyze their data separately, the number of hits they had um, divided by their number of at-bats. For these green points, instead, there's a somewhat complicated formula that links every player's estimate to estimates for all the other players, which is maybe at first doesn't sound very intuitive thing to do. Um, it correlates all the estimates. You could see it takes the cluster of estimates and moves them closer together. So it said that they shrink. The estimates shrink towards, in this case, towards roughly the mean of their performance. <clears throat> so I didn't write down the formula for this estimator. It's called the James Stein estimator. It doesn't generalize very well to other problems, but we're going to talk about similar types of estimators. <clears throat> 
So this is a nonlinear non function of the data. It's correlated. Each player's estimate depends on all the other players' estimates. It's also biased. If I were to repeat this over and over, um, the average of one of these players' estimates would be offset from the truth. <clears throat> However, the root mean squared error for each of these estimates on, on average is, uh, is closer to the truth than the maximum likelihood estimate. So I've shown here the root mean squared error between the James Stein estimates and the true estimates and the root mean square error between the maximum likelihood independent estimates and the truth. So um, in fact, it's, it's actually quite a bit smaller. So that's kind of an amazing uh, development that this very non-intuitive thing, non-linear for one thing, correlated for another, and biased, um, somehow is able to do better in the, in the metric of root mean squared error. So I try to depict it in another way on this plot. This shows the batting average and the full season rank of the player. So the blue dots are the true batting averages or the full season batting averages going from lowest to highest, Roberto Clemente. <clears throat> The red dots are the red dots from the previous plot. Those are the maximum likelihood estimates, the independent estimates for each player. And the green dots are this weird shrinkage estimator that correlates everything and biases things somewhat. And the lines connect whichever estimate is closer to the, the true value um, for each player. And you can see in almost every case, it's the green shrinkage estimate that's closer to the truth. So again, it's just another way of saying um, that those estimators are better um, by various metrics. Um, and so what, what's going on here? So, um, so mathematically, uh, what kind of started this being an exciting field was, was that Stein proved a theorem that in dimensions bigger than three, in this kind of setting where you have a bunch of related quantities measured with normal, measured kind of draws from a normal distribution measured with noise, um, that there is always, uh, if the, in dimensions better, bigger than three, that this type of estimator can always beat the independent maximum likelihood estimators in terms of their root mean squared error. What does and it mean dimension? Dimension, so just the number of players. So as long as I'm going to estimate the batting averages for uh, more than three, it might be greater than or equal to, I forget. That's why I put the twiddle here. Um, more than two, then, then um, you'll do better by using these strange correlated biased estimators. Um, and so Brad Efren has described this as the single most striking result of post-World War II statistical theory. So um, hierarchical Bayesian methods are a way to, develop, to kind of uh, generalize what's going on in this problem to much richer classes of problems. But let's just think conceptually about what's going on here. So all 18 players are human beings playing baseball. So they're members of a population. They bear some relationship to each other in their performance in the game. They're not just arbitrary, unrelated, binomial random number generators, right? They're all humans playing baseball. So suppose I gave you information about you know, a dozen players playing baseball. Maybe you didn't know anything about baseball. And then I mentioned a, a 13th player, and I asked you to guess what that player's performance was. If, uh, you would probably guess it would be something like the other player's performance, right? So in the absence of data about one of the players, we might use the performance of the other players to, to guide a guess about that player's performance. Um, Efren has recently introduced the term indirect evidence about that kind of information. No direct data about a player, but since you know that player is a member of a population and you know about other members of the population, that tells you something about that player. Um, but information that's relevant to estimating that player's performance in the absence of data stays relevant when you do have data. And shrinkage estimators basically are our way to account for this. They're saying, OK, you have this weak indirect evidence, um, but you, if you additionally get some direct evidence, you should be pooling that evidence together, not just ignoring the indirect evidence. And uh, a term of art that you'll see in the literature is people will talk about there being borrowing of strength, or the original term by, by Tukey, the inventor of the FFT, was that there's mustering and borrowing of strength across the population. Um, 
So hierarch hierarchical Bayesian modeling is one of the most flexible ways to generalize this idea and use it to improve estimation um, in settings that are, can have a much richer structure than, than the one we just described. And there are even uh, versions of them, this empirical Bayes approximation to them that we'll mention briefly, are even used in the frequentist literature to, to, as kind of a tool for generating uh, new versions of these shrinkage estimators. <clears throat> okay, so that was just by way of motivation. So we're going to do this from a Bayesian point of view. So the plan for the rest of the time, and we'll see how far we get. We might not get through all of it, but um, uh, we'll start by just uh, going through a recap of Bayesian inference. So just establishing my, my notation and uh, the terminology and some of you maybe are new, newer to Bayes than others, and so you, you might be seeing uh, some of the terms for, uh, for the first or only second time, but others will take a nap, I'm sure. Um, then I'm going to present the, just the key idea in terms of the, the kinds of formulas that appear um, without a lot of insight, but uh, just the, the general idea of the, the formulas that appear in a context that arises in astronomy, which is dealing with measurement error. Like if you're taking a survey, you're trying to infer like a luminosity function for galaxies. But you measure each galaxy's flux and redshift with uncertainty. How do you account for those uncertainties, so-called measurement errors, when you try to infer the distribution? Or you're trying to find, uh, 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 do a, a straight line fit, um, say for the Tully-Fisher relation, you know, the. Uh, um, luminosity and velocity of relating the, vo this is a linear law relating velocity and, and a certain velocity parameter and luminosity of galaxies. Um, the, both the, the, uh, the predictor and the outcome are measured with error. And so you have to fit a line to data that has error, not just in the Y, but also in the X. That's in statistical lingo, that's called a measurement error problem when you also have error in the X, and it makes these problem, such problems non-trivial. And uh, so that's another measurement error problem. So those are the kinds of problems that I'll just briefly outline here to kind of uh, show you where these ideas are important and what the basic math is. Um, so, so you'll see pretty much everything you need to know to kind of do the stuff, at, at least in principle. Uh, by this part of the lecture. And then for the rest of the lecture, as we have time, we're just going to go deeper into the concepts by looking at some very simple examples and kind of beating the terminology to death. Um, okay? <clears throat> All right, so Bayesian inference, this is just a one slide, mostly textual recap, and then we'll go through some equations. So, um, the first thing to say is that it thinks about probability differently than the frequentist approach. And the frequentist approach, the word frequentist refers to frequency or uh, proportion. Probabilities are understood as describing how often an event uh, may occur, either in an infinite set of repetitions of an experiment or across or by uh, repeatedly sampling from a population. So, Probability is used to describe variability upon repeated sampling or repeated experimentation. In Bayesian inference, probability is used in a much more abstract way. Um, it's thought, it, you can think of it as kind of a generalization of logic, where in logic you reason from certain premises to a conclusion and you try to determine whether your line of argument is, is valid or not. Uh, probability theory, in, instead of handling cases where you can say the argument is definitely valid or not valid, it handles cases of uncertainty, quantify, kind of providing a measure of how strong an argument of, is on a scale from zero to one, where zero and one, those limits correspond to regular logic, where you can defin conclude definitely that an argument is true or false, but the numbers in between give you a, a more uh, uh, richer kind of scale of strength of arguments. Um, and so the idea is to appraise hypotheses for some data that we have uh, from some observations. We'll calculate probabilities that argue from the data and some modeling assumptions um, in favor or against the hypotheses. 
And so Bayesian inference or Bayesian statistics gets its name from Bayes' theorem, but really uh, uh, what I want to emphasize in this part of the talk is uh, Bayesian inference is about more than Bayes' theorem. It uses all of probability theory, and in fact, um, we're going to talk about two theorems, and it, I'll argue that it uses the other theorem more than it uses Bayes' theorem. So, so the two main theorems from probability theory that it uses are Bayes' theorem, uh, which in kind of quasi-math says that the, the probability for hypotheses given some data and some modeling assumptions, or the strength of an argument reasoning from the data to a hypothesis, it's proportional to a prior probability for the hypothesis times a probability for the data if you assume for the moment that the hypothesis actually is operating. Um, so in words, what this says is that uh, learning data, so adding data to your, the premises of your argument, um, change the support of a hypothesis proportional to the ability of the hypothesis to predict the data. So, the two words I highlighted in blue are change because there's this prior term. So you start with some prior strength for the hypothesis and you'll end up with a posterior strength. And the way the change happens is by looking how well the, at how well the hypothesis predicts the data. In particular, by comparing how rival hypotheses predict the data. And then uh, a, a second theorem, which we'll talk about more in a moment, is the law of total probability. Many hypotheses of interest are actually what are called composite hypotheses. They're, they're, um, they can be broken down as, uh, into constituent hypotheses. And if one of those is true, then your composite hypothesis is true. Um, and so what the law of total probability says is if you're interested in the probability for a composite hypothesis, given data or anything else, you have to sum over the probabilities of its constituents. So the support of a composite hypothesis has to account for all the ways it could be true. Um, and we'll see some examples of how that arises. So that's just in words, Bayesian inference. So let's um, <clears throat> go remind you of those two theorems. If, if you haven't seen them already, maybe you'll, you'll see them for the first time here. So um, all the symbols here are, you should understand as propositions, yes, no, statements that are either true or false. And, um, and the bar you should think of as kind of a, an, denoting an argument that if I assume the, these propositions are true, then I'm trying to ascertain how strongly I'm allowed to conclude that the the statements on the left are true. So let's look at this uh, joint uh, probability um, and um, kind of suggestively using uh, notation here that H sub I stands for the, a hypothesis among some discrete set, discrete for now. And D observed is the, a, a statement of what the observed data uh, tell us. And C just stands for a kind of context for our argument, the, any kind of modeling assumptions. And we'll just use the product rule, which I'll, I'll assume is familiar to people, that a, a joint probability for two propositions is the probability of one times the probability of the second um, adding the first to the uh, premises. And that you can uh, use the, the, the two components of the joint thing, the joint hypothesis. Um, the joint propositions in any either order. So I've done the probability for the second times probability of the first given the second. Um, what we're going to be interested in is the probability for the hypotheses now that we've learned the, the observed data. So we'll set these two right-hand sides equal and solve for this one. Um, so uh, if I this is now going to be equal to these two divided by this one. So that's what I've written over here. So basically, what this is now Bayes' theorem. It's uncontroversial as a, in terms of manipulation of symbols, but it, what's controversial is whether you're allowed to use it when you have hypotheses to the left of the bar. And um, basically, it's a formula for letting you add new information to the, to the premises of an argument. So here's the starting point. I might have some background information or models or whatever that tell me something about the hypotheses. And now I'm asking, well, suppose now I get some new information in the observed data. How does that change things? And this is the modulating factor. So um, 
When you're talking about pro probabilities for hypotheses in data, each of these factors or terms has a name. So this is called the posterior probability for the hypothesis given the data. This is called the prior probability for the hypothesis. This thing has two names. Um, it's, it's a probability for data, but uh, so, so it, and when you focus on the data, it's called the sampling probability for the data or the sampling distribution for the data. Um, but it also tells you something about uh, how rival hypotheses compare. So if you look at it as a function of the hypotheses to the right of the bar, it's not a probability for them, but in some sense, if the value of this thing is larger for one hypothesis than an another, um, you would think that would tend to at least modulate things to favor that, that hypothesis that makes the data more probable. So as a function of what's to the right of the bar, it has a different name than probability. It's called likelihood. Um, and this thing in the bottom, is a, uh, it doesn't depend on the hypotheses. So um, you, it's just basically plays the role of a normalization constant. We'll see that more explicitly in a moment. Um, so it's sometimes called the prior predictive because it's saying before you make a choice about the hypotheses, uh, before you even get the data, what's the probability with which you would predict the actual observed data that you obtain? Okay. So that's one theorem, Bayes' theorem. But the second theorem doesn't get enough attention, in, in my opinion. It's the law of total probability. So suppose we have in our problem a, a set of uh, kind of auxiliary hypotheses, you, if you will. I'm going to label them by B sub i. And they're exclusive and exhaustive. So um, only one of these can be true. If one is true, then the rest have to be false. That's what exclusive means. And exhaustive means that I'm going to assume that, in fact, one of them is true. It's not true. Um, I haven't ignored the, the alternative that's actually true. So let's uh, just, just uh, for the sake of argument for now, let's just look at this joint probability, the probability for some statement A and one of the Bs and then sum it over the b's. And let's just use the product rule to uh, factor that. So we can write this joint probability as p of a times p of the b's given a. If I do that, there's no i index in this probability, so I can take that out. And then since this is, these are exclusive and exhaustive, this sum of probabilities has to sum to 1. So I just get that if I sum this joint over the second slot, I just get the probability of what's in the first slot. Um, alternatively, I could have factored this joint as P of B, one of the Bs, and then P of A given one of the Bs. So the law of total probability is kind of all of these equations. It says that uh, they're all any one of these. If you want any one of these, you can use the others to try to get it. And why am I making a fuss about it? Well, it, it appears in two different ways in, when you're doing Bayesian calculations. Suppose I'm seeking the probability for some interesting statement about the universe or something, uh, or about a, ex, a galaxy or an exoplanet system. And so the, the, the information I might have, P stands for premises. It might include some observed data. And I'm interested in, you know, say, what's the probability for the mass of a planet being in some interval? Well, um, if I'm given, say, an RV light curve, it might not be obvious how to calculate the probability for the mass of a planet given some time series. But if I knew the orbital elements of the planet, then I would be able to calculate its mass because there's a relationship from Kepler's laws between the orbital elements and the mass. So I would introduce those unknown things that could help me as if I knew them. Those are the Bs. So the probability of A given the Bs would be something that I'd know. The probability for the mass if I knew the orbital elements, that, that would be trivial. It would actually be a delta function. Um, but then I'll take into account the fact that I don't know the Bs by inserting their probability and averaging over them. So this is sometimes called extending the conversation. It's kind of the probability theory analog to expanding something in an orthonormal basis. Um, I need this. I don't see how to get it. But if I introduce Bs that tell me about As and account for their uncertainty, then uh, I can use the law of total probability to expand this into pieces that I may know.
The second way the law of total probability works is if I have a problem that has A's and B's already in it, but I'm only interested in A. In this case, this first line tells me that if I'm just interested in A, then I can just sum over the B's and I'll get what all my available information tells me about A. So a kind of a prototypical example of that would be when we're estimating the signal in the presence of background, like the, the flux of a star when there, or a galaxy when there's background. I, I need to specify the, the, star, the galaxy flux and the background to model the data, so I might already have those in my you know, chi-squared or whatever my, my code is. Um, but I want to report what I know, what I've learned just about the galaxy. So this is saying the way you do that is you just sum your joint posterior for the, the galaxy luminosity in the background over the possible background values. And that will give you a, a summary for the quantity of interest that takes into account the uncertainty for the thing that's not interesting. And that's called marginalization. It's a weird word. Uh, the word comes from imagining list, listing values of A and B along the, the rows and columns of a table, and then in the margins, listing sums along the rows and columns. And so the, the sums along the rows are the, the marginals. So just as a, a, another an explicit example, um, suppose A were the uh, a statement saying what the data were that I observed, and the Bs were some set of hypotheses of interest, then one way I could use one example of the use of the law of total probability is computing the thing in the denominator of Bayes' theorem. Remember, there's that prior predictive probability. I asserted that it must just be a normalization constant. Well, it's not obvious what it is, really. Um, but on the other hand, so let's pretend for the moment that I knew that the, a particular hypothesis was in operation. So I can factor this as P of H, P of D given H. Um, and now I see this is the likelihood, this is the prior, and the law of total probability involves the sum over them. So I've shown explicitly that the denominator of Bayes' theorem is the sum of the numerator. So remember, here's Bayes' theorem. So I've just shown explicitly with the law of total probability that this is the sum of the thing in the top. So um, it had to be. We, we could see that since the H sub I doesn't appear down here, but it's nice to have a theorem that shows it. And this uh, gives rise to another term for this quantity. It's sometimes called the marginal likelihood because this is the likelihood and I'm marginalizing it, uh, marginalizing basically the joint distribution of the data and hypotheses um, over, over the hypothesis space. <clears throat> okay. Um, so that was uh, all done in kind of a dis discrete language. Let's talk about a continuum of hypotheses, like uh, a bunch of hypotheses described by a continuous parameter. Um, so there's some model that has some parameters, possibly a vector of them, uh, theta. And the hypotheses of interest would be statements about theta, for example, that it lies in some interval or that it's positive. You know, maybe you're interested in um, lambda for in cosmology, the cosmological constant. Is, what's the probability that it's above zero? Um, the probability for any such statement can be found from a probability density function. Um, so the probability that theta is in some infinitesimal interval, I'll write as the density function times the size of the interval. I'll sometimes use a lowercase p for a density function when I want to show its uh, dependence on um, conditional quantities. Um, and so what you can show easily, if somewhat sloppily, is that Bayes' theorem holds for probability densities just as it does for probabilities. Um, I'll leave that as an exercise for the reader. You just basically make, make everything here a probability by multiplying this by a d theta and this by a d theta. And this would be by a d data and a d data. And you'll see all the infinitesimals cancel out. So you're just left with the, what looks just like Bayes' theorem. But instead of probabilities, it's relating uh, uh, probability densities. The, the posterior density is proportional to the prior density times the likelihood function divided by their uh, integral. <clears throat>
Um, and then this is just to uh, have some terminology. Um, the Bayesian answer to a, 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 a parameter estimation problem is the full posterior distribution. Um, if you want to summarize it, there are various kind of conventional summaries. Um, if you really need a unique summary, a unique best estimate, um, then you have to look at another, an extra piece of, of Bayesian statistics, which is decision theory, which we won't talk about. But um, uh, less formally, uh, you could summarize it with uh, the mode, theta hat is often used as a symbol. It's the value of theta that maximizes this. There might be more than one. The posterior mean, you just insert theta and integrate. Um, a credible region is the Bayesian analog for a confidence region. Um, it's a, a region, in this case I've denoted it delta, that uh, it's a region of the parameter space where if you integrate the posterior over that region, it has some target, desired target value of probability. There we go. A couple more of these. Um, yeah, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Okay, and so this is a, actually a key point here. So often uh, parameter estimation problems, the parameters can be divided into two groups, interesting and non-interesting, uh, just like we just talked about. So signal and background would be the, the most common example. Um, so if you have some interesting parameters phi, so this theta is a vector, uh, uh, some components of it are phi, and some uninteresting components of it I'm denoting by eta, then you can summarize what the data have told you about the interesting parameters, accounting for the uncertainty in the uninteresting parameters by computing the joint distribution for all of the parameters and integrating it over the uninteresting parameters. So this is called the, the marginal posterior distribution. And again, this is the law of total probability at work again. And this is, uh, from my point of view, this is actually one of the key uh, practical uh, appeals of uh, Bayesian methods is almost every real world problem has nuisance parameters and from the Bayesian point of view there's a straightforward way to deal with them. In frequentist statistics it's notoriously complicated to, to deal with them. There's no one method that works well uh, across many problems. There's a whole literature on, on how to deal with them. Um, often very complicated ways. So. Um, Let's see, do I want to go through this? I think, I think that's enough for, to talk about marginalization <clears throat> for now. All right, um, so that was our first, uh, uh, the first part of our agenda. So just a recap of basic Bayesian inference in the simple, what would be called, what you'll learn in a minute is just a, a simple one level or two level uh, model, uh, the, the standard terminology about priors and likelihoods. Um, but now let me just try to convey the key idea of uh, hierarchical models. And we'll do that in the context of measurement error in astronomical surveys. So um, what I've shown here is data about um, the strength of the brightness of gamma ray bursts. These uh, about roughly once a day we see explosions on the sky. You don't see them with your eyes because they happen in gamma rays which are strongly absorbed by the atmosphere and invisible to the eye in any case. Um, so, uh, but these are among the brightest events that we know of in the universe, the most luminous um, and the brightest, um, the most luminous in terms of their intrinsic energy release and the brightest in terms of how they appear from the Earth. Um, so they happen at random locations on the sky roughly once a day. And what I've shown here in blue is a cumulative histogram of uh, what's called the peak flux, a measure of the brightness of gamma ray bursts. So there's some distribution that has some interesting uh, shape or structure to it. And so astronomers would like to understand this structure and see what it tells us. It tells us something about the distribution of intrinsic brightnesses of gamma ray bursts, that some are, there are a certain fraction of them are, uh, are dim, a certain fraction are very bright intrinsically. And then it also tells us something about their spatial distribution. Ones that are nearby will appear to be bright. Ones that are uh, far away will appear to be dim. Um, so it tells us about those two things together. Um, so we'd really like to understand the, in detail the shape of this. 
uh, but there are two corrupting influences in the data that make this hard. One of these influences is obvious and few astronomers would overlook it, and that is a so-called selection effect. So you see the cumulative distribution goes up here and stops at this, this uh, flux level, peak flux level here, which is a uh, over a hundred times uh, dimmer than the brightest one over here. And it's not that there are no gamma ray bursts dimmer than that, it's just that our detectors aren't sensitive enough to detect them. So, um, so we miss the ones dimmer than this, but you'll see this curve is slowly declining but then ver flattens very much before it reaches that limit. Um, it turns out above that limit, there's an increasing probability of detection, but it doesn't just jump from zero to one. So there's, uh, not only do we get uh, some kind of truncation of what's to the left of that curve, but there's some effect of our selection, our detection capability on the shape of the curve in, at its dim end. So it's called selection effects. And there are ways that we have to try to handle that, some good, some bad. What's more insidious, and often overlooked um, is what I'm calling for the moment scatter effects. Um, and uh, those uh, I try to depict with this bunch of red dots. So what are those? So there are two ordinates on this plot. This is the number of bursts greater than a certain flux. That's the ordinate for the blue curve. But the right ordinate tells you the fractional error in the flux of each gamma ray burst that was measured here. So the dot tells you, like this dot here, tells me that the burst that had this flux had about 12% measurement error. And so you can see that for the majority of bursts, the measurement error is actually quite large. So even though I've drawn a histogram here of the F hats, the estimates of the peak fluxes, actually a cumulative histogram, so I've ranked them and then, and then counted them, Actually, I don't know the ranks of most of these uh, to quite a large level of uncertainty. So, um, so this, uh, this so-called scatter or uh, measurement error in the flux is also distorting the shape of this curve. It's doing something like a convolution. But it's not really a convolution. It's more complicated than that. It has different scales at different places on the, on the plot. And, um, it's often ignored in, in astronomical analyses. It seems that the intuition is often that maybe it would kind of average out, and it turns out that this is a kind of effect that, rather than averaging out, actually accumulates. The bigger data you have, if you ignore the uncertainties and just treat the fluxes as if they were precise, then the more your results, your inferences on the shapes of this distribution converge away from the truth. Um, so that's, yeah. So uh, for the selection effects, do those happen uh, before or after the, um, the uncertainty on the yeah. uh, it, it, in, it's, in a simple case where you just had a, a selection effect that was a, a kind of a one zero right. vertical line, or right. do you not see things if their true flux is below? Right. So, yeah. So the ideal case, actually, that's a very good question. It actually raises some subtle points. But um, so the ideal case is not instructive enough. To, so in the ideal case, uh, you know, if there's something that's missed, then you don't ever measure it, right? Um, but in the uh, the real case. Um, Really what tends to happen in most settings is that we get data. So like in this case, these are observed on a spacecraft. There's a spacecraft counting photons from different directions on the sky. Every second it's counting photons. Some, it's also estimating a background. Sometimes the number of photons go, is seen several times above the background rate. Sometimes it's not. So every moment it's making a decision, it's taken a measurement, and it's making a decision about whether to keep it or not. So um, usually what happens is that a measurement is made and based on the measurement, a decision is made about whether to keep that data or to publish that data in a catalog or not. So in some sense, it's really the measurement that happens first and then the da some data are discarded or not. That's not always the case. A good example is exoplanets, something we're dealing with downstairs. Um, 
You detect, one of the ways to detect them is by transits. So an exoplanet passing in front of a star makes its brightness decrease just very slightly, often just a fraction of a percent. And we try to detect those things. So um, there are two selection effects in operation. So uh, one is that when they measure the light curve, um, they just might not measure any dimming, in which case they just don't report it. You know, that data, it's probably archived on some disk somewhere, but it doesn't show up in a catalog, right? But there was a measurement. But the other thing is not every planet happens to pass between the Earth and the star. So there's another selection effect that, depending on how big the orbit is, how big the planet is, how big the star is, there's a selection effect that determines whether there was even a transit possible for that system. So that's a case where there's two selection effects. There's one that determines whether or not there was something even in principle measurable by an ideal instrument, noiseless instrument, but then there's another selection effect that's related to the noise in the measurement. Did that help, help at all? Yeah. yeah. I guess I have a, a second question about the, so the scattering effect. So this uh, blue curve is like an unnormalized CEF, so it's like one, one minus, if you normalize this blue curve and then just one minus it, it would be a CEF. Right. Right. So the, the scatter effect is going like, kind of smooth out. The That's density, right. And mm -hmm. then uh, that would make the, uh, I guess that also smooths the CDF. I'm just trying to imagine mm -hmm. what the, uh, like how the CDF, like what direction the scatter effect is biasing. The so uh, one way to think of it is there's some true CDF. I don't know what it is. but. Um, uh, yeah, it's easier to think of it in terms of the PDF. So basically, the kind of story that we all learn in, in grad school is there's some, some, imagine a binned distribution of the true fluxes, F true. Um, so we'll bin them, let's, let's suppose they look like, it looks like this, right? And then we're gonna observe, um, and get noisy estimates. And so the idea is, in the simplest case of symmetric noise, the same scale for all the Fs, um, there's more uh, sources in this bin than in the neighboring bins. So it's more likely that things will scatter out of this bin than into it. And so there's a flattening that happens for that. And in this case, there's probably more things will scatter in that bin than, than out. So there's yeah, it's just what you said. There's a there's a smoothing. I don't know how to I, you know I don't know how to draw it on this board, but um, you might see something like that, and it would actually it might even have a wider support. If this was a finite support, this one could even have a wider support. Um, in the simplest case that I just mentioned, symmetric errors, uh, same scale everywhere. This is just a, literally a convolution. I don't know what it looks like in CDF space, but. Um, uh, but it's, it's not really a convolution because the scale is different everywhere. And for, I mean, even for objects of a, of a similar flux, it can be different just because of different conditions in, in the space, in the instrument. Okay, but it could destroy modes. In the yeah, it can destroy it can modes. It usually can't add modes, but um, yeah. And then is this blue curve, is that what people call luminosity function? No, this, so this is what people would call the number counts or the log n log s, that it's an, a size frequency curve. Uh, um, log n, so the terminology for it is log n log s. Um, that's what gamma ray burst astronomers call it. Uh, galac if this were for galaxies, number counts is, an, is a standard terminology for it. I think I wrote these down somewhere later in the talk. But, um, and then a general term for plots like this across many disciplines is uh, size frequency distributions. So log n log s is um, number size. So s here, size would be brightness. But it could be, there are log n log s number size frequency distributions for like craters on the moon. Distribution of craters as a function of size. So, so their size would literally be, you know, area or length or something. Mm 
is um, the y axis a lot of times in logs? Is it yeah, it typically is all, mainly because um, for reasons that are important to know but that I won't go into, um, these laws tend to be power laws. So uh, in, this, in the case of astronomy, that's just a function of geometry of space. Uh, the, the combination of the, uh, the inverse square law, which has a power law in it, and the growth of volume with, with a power of radius, those things conspire so that if you had a population of sources all with exactly the same luminosity, but distributed homogeneously in space, then this would look like a straight line with a slope of minus three halves. Okay. So um, because you can parameterize it, you, it's sort of harder to, for at least for me, or I like thinking about a PDF. But yeah, me too. To parameterize and just That's right, exactly, yeah. So if you draw a PDF for this, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a curve. Um, it's a you know it'll it would look something like uh, f to the minus three halves roughly f of f it would look like uh, f to the minus five halves roughly speaking. In fact, this this part of this curve is actually pretty close to f to the minus five halves. Um, so just a weird power law thing. Um, which, but it looks like a, if, if that were all that were going on, it would look like a straight line here, which is why we plot it in log log space to give us some intuition about that. <clears throat> okay. Um, all right, so the, so the issue, so I'm going to forget about selection effects for the rest of the talk. They're very important. They're one of the main things we're talking about downstairs but there's only so much I can talk about. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about the, the scatter effects, which are the ones that are often ignored and a, a little trickier to deal with. Uh, not always, but uh, sometimes. So, um, so suppose we have a distribution for some observable x. In the case of the gamma ray bursts, it could be flux. In the case of galaxies, it might be redshifts of galaxies or distances of galaxies or sizes of galaxies or luminosities of galaxies, whatever. Um, there might be a vector, right? Um, and we'd want to learn the shape of this distribution as a function of some parameters theta. Maybe we think it's a power law, but with an unknown index. Um, or it's a power law that, that uh, truncates at maybe the bright end and the dim end. There's, there aren't galaxies of arbitrarily brightness, and there aren't arbitrarily small ones, and it would be interesting. There's interesting astrophysics in learning those cutoff scales. Those could be parameters in theta. So if x is one-dimensional, like the flux of a gamma ray burst, there's a line, and there are the true fluxes of the gamma ray bursts on that line. If f were two-dimensional, like, say, the, the distance and the luminosities of galaxies, then there's a two-dimensional distribution. It has some contours, and each galaxy's true luminosity and distance would give it a location in this 2D plot. Now, I'm guessing, I'm hoping that you all would know how to estimate this, this theta if you were given the precise values of x, right? So you, um, you would probably start with a likelihood function. Even if you didn't know about Bayesian methods, you would find what's the probability for all the x's that I've measured just multiply that population distribution for each of the x's. And then um, I might try to just maximize the likelihood function for a point estimate. Or if I wanted to do the Bayesian thing, I would multiply this product of f's by a prior. And um, uh, prior times likelihood is just the numerator of Bayes' theorem, which is the joint distribution for the theta and, and the x's. So, I'm hoping you all know how to do this. This is, this is called, uh, by the way, just if you ever wanted to know the name, this is called a binomial point process. Um, so that's the name of that type of process or set of distributions. Um, but as I said, in, in most real problems, we actually don't get precise values for the things that we'd like to know the distribution of we get some noisy values. So the data are the precise values plus some error. Or there might be some more complicated relationship between the data and what, what, we're, what we'd like to measure the distribution of. So instead of knowing the precise 
uh, blue dots, we instead have some kind of uncertainty for each of the true values. Or here, they're just kind of blurs in the 2D space. So the x's themselves now are uncertain. So for each gamma ray burst, I don't know its true flux. I could think of its true flux as itself a parameter in this problem. That's not known. And those such parameters are sometimes called latent parameters. That's probably the most common term. Incidental is an early term that was used for them. Um, so somehow we need to incorporate into our uh, analysis or inference about the population, the fact that uh, these measurements for the x's are uncertain. And we're going to incorporate that uncertainty through what I'm going to call, uh, I'll write, it's written in a later slide, the member likelihood function. So for each object, I have some data. If I calculate the probability for that data as a function of the true flux or luminosity of the object, I'll get a likelihood function. That would be something like you know, e to the minus chi squared over 2 for astronomers of if I were doing like a chi squared fit of the, the flux um, in say PSF photometry or something like that. So there's this member likelihood function that describes the shape of these uncertainties, okay? Now I can write down, I'm just going to use basic probability theory to write down the joint distribution for everything that's a priori unknown in this problem. So I don't know the parameters for the population. I don't know the true values of the properties of all the objects. And a priori, I don't know the data. Um, this thing I can write down as a probability, some prior probability. It's a joint, so I'm going to work through the joint. Uh, so P of the first times P of the rest given the first. Um, but P of the rest, if I'm assuming the observations were independently done for each object, I'm going to get uh, a likelihood function for each of the objects. And I'm going to get a probability for all the x's um, just from my population model. So that's going from here to here. Here's the prior is copied. The probability for all the unknown true values of the x's is just a product from the previous slide. It's just that binomial point process model, a product of the population distribution at all the unknown x's. Um, and then I'll account for the uncertainty in the x's just by copying down the, the likelihood function, the e to the minus chi squared over 2 or whatever for each object and put that there. Um, now once I get data, I can do Bayes' theorem. I want to condition on the data. And to do that, I take the joint and divide it by the marginal. So the, the joint is just prior times the likelihood divided by the marginal. Um, but since this doesn't depend on the things of interest, the theta and the x's, I, I don't have to worry about it. So Bayes' theorem says that if you can write down the joint distribution for everything, you basically have everything you need to do Bayesian inference. You have the numerator prior times likelihood. So that's kind of everything in principle that you need to know to, to be using hierarchical Bayesian methods at this point. Now you just have to somehow uh, you know, learn how to manipulate and summarize this joint distribution of everything. But um, let's, let's go a little bit into that and, and see what's actually going on under the covers in this and try to relate it to some of that shrinkage stuff that we talked about earlier. Right? So we now have, if I have n gamma ray bursts, there were about 1,000 in the previous slide, I now have however many population parameters I have, maybe the height and the power law of a power law distribution. So that would be two parameters plus 1,000. So I've made my problem much more complicated in terms of numbers of parameters. But um, that's the price you have to pay if you don't actually know the true values of the properties of all the objects in your uh, problem. And so the idea is, did I say it on the next slide? Yeah, there it is. So I just copied what I had previously. There's a Bayes' theorem is the, the joint probability for all the unknowns given the data. That's just proportional to the joint probability for everything. Um, including the data, and I've shown that it's a prior times a, a product of population and member likelihood. So if I want to learn the population parameters, I want to learn the slope of my power law, I'll just marginalize this over those n uh, unknown uh, properties. 
that sounds terrible. If, I'm, if there's a thousand objects, I have to do a thousand dimensional integral to do that. So that is a, a, just a notation for P of the, the data for the ith object given the x. So right, yeah, so everything has a condition except for the prior, but I've just summarized it. Because all that matters. The probability of the observed value given the underlying. Yeah, so the idea here is once I get the data, the data are now fixed. So the only things, the only dependencies I'm worried about are the dependencies of, on, on the x's and the thetas. So that's, that's why I've made notation that just makes the data disappear. So once I have data, those are now just fixed numbers in the code. I'm not interested in how things behave as a function of those numbers. I know those numbers. Those are now constants. Um, I know the number of photons I got from gamma ray burst 3. That's just a number that I know. That would be the data for well, D3. It's a distribution, you know, right? You have a measurement with it. But once I have the measurement, so there's a, so for example, for gamma, the simplest case, no, no uh, background or whatever, there'll be some Poisson distribution for the number of counts from number of photons from the gamma ray burst in my detector, right? Then I make an observation. I see 100 photons. That's now a number that I know. But you see 100 plus or minus 10. No, no. You will, you will only see one number of photons. You never see 100 plus or minus 10. You would predict. 100 plus or minus 10. But once you take an observation in your CCD, or in this case, there's you know, scintillators and photometers. But, but your error bars are folded into that LX. No, so the error bars are, uh, so actually hold the question and we'll go through a case where we're flipping coins where we actually see these two, how, how this thing looks as a function of both sides and, and uh, how if you fix this, all the uncertainties appear in just this dependence, how this thing depends on x. So, this uh, thing, you mean the P of DI given Yeah. Time? We'll go through an example, I hope. Um, OK. So um, all right. So uh, yeah, so if I'm interested in learning about the population, I do this 1,000-dimensional integral. But it's a product of a 1,000 independent terms. Each of the x's only appear. So it's actually a thousand one-dimensional or two-dimensional integrals. So it's not quite so hard as it sounds. If I want to come up with good estimates for the fluxes of every gamma ray burst or the luminosity or the redshift of every galaxy, then I want to take into account my uncertainty in the population. So I would marginalize over the thetas and look at uh, one or more of the x's. Um, and a key point that you see in the literature about this is that if you were to just use the maximum likelihood values of the x's, you know, just instead of taking f of x, l of x, and integrating over x, which is what you would do from a Bayesian point of view, if instead I just say, well, I'll just plug in my best fit flux, x hat, over here and ignore this term. If you do that, that's disastrous. It's a bigger disaster the more data you have, ironically enough. Um, and this is, a, this is a link if you download the PDF. Um, this is a paper where I run through some simple examples where you see that failure happening. <clears throat> OK. Um, I think I'm going to skip the next slide. And so let's, let's see, 20 minutes. Yeah, let's see what we can do here. And We'll try to get to here, which is the example that I was just telling you about, this beta binomial model. Um, OK. So that's the apparatus. That's kind of the basic math of hierarchical modeling. And um, so now I want to teach you a little more about some of the lingo, why it's called hierarchical. And there, these are also sometimes called graphical models, why they have that name. Um, so that you're familiar with some of the lingo and some of the techniques for building models with even richer structure than the simple measurement error model we just described. So we'll step back and we'll, we'll look at joint and conditional distributions. So remember, Bayes' theorem is something that we found by looking at a joint distribution and factoring it into different conditional distributions and relating them. So uh, Bayesian inference is largely about how joint and various conditional distributions are related. So, 
here it is. I was just speaking about it. So Bayes' theorem, remember, posterior is prior times likelihood divided by uh, prior predictive. This thing in the top, P of H, P of D given H, remember we got that just by factoring the joint. So it's P of H and D. So this is the key thing to know in terms of understanding the kind of the big picture of hierarchical and graphical models is that you're, you're interested in a posterior for hypotheses conditioned on the data, um, but you can get that by writing a joint distribution for everything, the hypotheses and the data, and dividing it by the marginal distribution of what, what you do know once you have the data. Um, and since that doesn't depend on the things of interest, the H's, in fact, everything you need to know uh, is you can, you can get from looking at the joint distribution for everything, the data and the hypotheses. So I'm making a point of that because um, when you're doing non-hierarchical Bayesian inference, you always tend to think about priors and likelihoods. But when you're doing models with richer structure than, than those, it's better to think about uh, the joint distribution for everything. So the usual form for Bayes' theorem uh, is the separation into prior and likelihood is just exploiting the fact that we usually know this joint distribution in terms of these two factors. So this is a kind of a two-dimensional object, um, but it's usually available to us as the product of these two one-dimensional, mostly one-dimensional things, one-dimensional pr in probability. Um, so this can be expressed by what's called a direct did acyclic graph, and I'll say more about them here, but it's just saying that um, if I know H, then I can predict D. That's what this distribution is. Um, P of D given H, this is a, a pictorial notation to say that if I know H, it lets me predict D. So let's, let's say more about what these graphs are and, and what they mean. So these so-called graphs are a way to describe the, the kind of abstract structure of joint distributions. So a graph, um, this is just a mathematical computer science term, it's a collection of nodes or vertices that are connected by edges and links, and, and or links, these are just different words for the same thing. So these are the nodes, this is the edge or link. Um, for probabilistic graphs, the nodes are going to be quantities that a priori are uncertain so-called random variables. Um, and we're going to uh, indicate uh, the particular variables that become known once we make observations by having them be gray, or if you were writing this by hand, it's inconvenient to, to do gray, gray. A common convention is to use boxes for things that become known from observation and uh, round nodes for things that are uncertain that we'd like to infer. Um, so directed edges, an edge with an arrow, specifies uh, what's called conditional dependence, which we'll talk more about in, in a minute. It basically says D depends on H. There's a conditional probability for D that's known to us by the choice of model or whatever. And then something we'll talk more about in a minute, absence of an edge indicates that two quantities don't depend on each other at all. Um, so let's talk. Of, let's look at the case of more than two quantities. So here's three x, y, and z. Um, and so imagine there's some joint distribution of interest to us, x, p of x, y, and z. There's lots of ways that you could factor this um, using the product rule of probability theory. So here's one. I could look at x, and then I could look at the probability for y given x, and then I could look at the probability for z given all the other things, x and y. And I can, if the problem is such that I happen to know these three functions, I can express that by drawing this graph down here. There's an x node that has no arrows coming into it, so that means that that's a way of showing graphically that what I know is some function p of x. There's a y node that has one arrow coming into it from x. That's saying that there's a function known to me, p of y given x. 
and then there's a Z node that has arrows coming from X and Y, so that's saying I know a conditional distribution for Z given X and Y. There are six different ways to factor a, th a three-parameter joint distribution, and I show their graphs here. Um, so they differ by which arrows point in which directions. Um, I don't want to go through every one of them, but um, hopefully you can kind of see the general structure here. Um, it's just you, you, there's w always one node that has nothing coming in it. That's the first thing that you pull out for your product rule decomposition. And then there's one node that has only one incoming arrow, so that's the next term, and so on. Um, one thing you'll see here is that you can never follow the arrows around in a circle. Um, you always get blocked somewhere. Like if I start at Y, I can go to X and Z, but then I can't go back to Y. X to Y to Z, oops, X to Y, or Z to X to Y, but I can't go back from Y to Z, and so on. So um, cycles are not allowed. So here's a graph with a cycle, X going to Y to Z to X. Let's write down what each of these would look like. So this is an X with an incoming arrow from Z. That would be P of X given Z, P of Y given X, P of Z given Y. There's nothing from the laws of probability theory that could let you factor a, a joint for three variables this way. That's why you never see cycles like this. And so these things, the allowed graphs in Bayesian uh, uh, models, are graphs like this that don't have cycles, so they're called directed, they have arrows, acyclic, because there are no cyclic cycles graphs, or DAGs, D-A-Gs for short. All right. <clears throat> Suppose for a problem at hand uh, that uh, Z might appear in my graph like this. So here's a graph, the first graph that we looked at two slides ago, P of X, P of Y given X, P of Z given X and Y. That's one possible factorization. But suppose that the function that I actually had for P of Z, given that everything else was known, actually didn't depend on X. And so I'll, I'll say something about an example like this in the problem. That would mean that um, if, if Z didn't depend on X, we could indicate that in the graph. If this function actually didn't depend on X, um, if knowing X didn't tell me anything about Z if I know Y, I would indicate on the, that on the graph by taking out this edge, which is what I've shown here. When that happens, there's special language and notation for this. We say that um, Z is conditionally independent of X when I know Y. So Z is influenced by X because X influences Y, but it's influenced in a way so that if I know Y, then learning the value of x doesn't tell me anything more about z. And we're going to see examples, a concrete example of this in a minute. So, um, so in this joint factorization, there's a 1D function, a 2D function, and a 3D function, right? But in this one where there's conditional independence, there's a 1D function and two 2D functions. So whenever there are missing edges in a graph, it means the problem is simpler than it could have been. Um, so I like to say that the most important edges in a graphical model are the missing ones. Those are the ones that indicate there's some simplification that's in the structure of the problem that's going to make your life a lot easier than it might have otherwise been. So the most important edges are the missing ones. This is the notation you'll sometimes see, pretty much never in astronomy, but if you read the statistics literature, this is saying Z is independent of X if I condition on Y. This double perpendicular symbol is the, the symbol for independence. It's, it means that this thing, if I were to, to try to compute this, in fact, X wouldn't appear. There would be no dependence on the value of X. Um, that's what this symbol denotes. Yeah. It actually depends on the circumstance. So like uh, for most of the things we're doing here, it's easier for me to think in terms of graphs first. 
But for other things, like I find, uh, like you and I both have worked with mixed effects models, right? For, for some reason, for those, I find it much easier to work in terms of the equations first than the graphs. The graphs I find to be more complicated than okay. writing down the equations. So for me, it's very problem specific. I, I think it's partly a personality thing. But I don't know, what about you? Do you? Uh, <laughs> you don't use graphs. Yeah. We, we won't be talking, uh, we won't have time to talk about Stan or uh, these computational, uh, these, these probabilistic programming models for expressing, for writing computer codes that are described by graphical models. But for those, if you're using those codes, they, they very much correspond to just kind of writing down a graph and you know, identifying what all the di distributions are. So when I'm working with Stan or JAGS or something, it helps, it helps me to have a graph in mind sketched out. Okay, so, um, all right, so let me say a little more about graphs for three quantities with missing edges. So this is the one that I just showed. Um, so there could have been, there can't, couldn't have been an arrow this way, but there could have been an arrow this way, but there isn't. I might draw that graph maybe more suggestively. <clears throat> I, I drew it that way just so that you could see it as a copy of the previous ones, but I would probably want to draw it something like this. So you could see that, you know, there's kind of a straight path uh, through the three quantities. So you, this would be the kind of graph that would describe a model where there's some kind of causal chain connecting three, three quantities. So for example, if x, y, and z were binary, so X could be, for example, um, whether someone's a smoker or not. Y could be whether they have cancer or not. And then Z could be whether they have labored breathing or not. I forget there, there's actually a name for that cancer symptom, dy dys dyspepnea or something like that. Um, so um, whether somebody has labored breathing is influenced by whether they smoke, right? But if I already tell you they have, because smoking causes cancer, which in the world that we'll consider for the moment would be the main cause of labored breathing, right? But if I tell you they have cancer, whether they smoke or not is now immaterial for, to determine whether or not they, uh, they have labored breathing, because labor, cancer always causes labored breathing, right? So in a causal chain, um, the, the line of causes and effects ends up blocking the upper level from the lower level, and that's expressed with this kind of conditional independence. Another kind, so that's a causal chain. Another kind of conditional independence is when two effects have a common cause. So I showed it there in the same triangle we've been showing, but the way I might want to show that, that's kind of easier for me to picture what's going on is, is to have a hierarchy, so X is on the top and Y and Z are on the bottom. So uh, if, with flow of cause to effect going down the board, there's some cause that X that causes both Y and Z. So for example, um, if X, if they're binary variables, X is whether or not you have cancer, Y is whether there's a, a, a spot in your X-ray, and Z is whether you have labor, labored breathing, right? Um, if I don't know whether you have cancer, telling, tell, finding that you have a spot on your X-ray influences whether I think you might have labored breathing or not. But if I already know you have cancer, then, uh, then I know you'll have labored breathing. I don't, even, I don't need to know anything about whether you have a spot on your X-ray. Um, so those are just kind of toy, pro, toy world things about this kind of conditional independence. Um, there's one other leg that you could have chopped off of the graph, and that has to do with um, conditional dependence. I, I, we don't have time to talk about that. Um, but that's where um, there are uh, two causes that might have a common effect. Um, but that's not uh, this conditional independence that we're talking about. <clears throat> I'm skip, definitely skipping that. Okay, so um, the kind of regular Bayesian inference that we 
all learned at the beginning can be expressed in a graph like this. This is Bayesian inference when you have IID or independently, actually it doesn't have to be identically, but independently distributed data. So there are some unknown parameters and then um, n, different n different measurements of data. And this graph says that if I know the values of the parameters, then I can tell you the predictive distribution for each of the data. So I've written that down here by saying there's a product. Uh, instead of there being a joint, like if n-dimensional function, I can write that n-dimensional function as the product of n one-dimensional functions. This is a, a lot simpler than this. This is something that could have arbitrarily uh, dependencies between x1 and x2 and x3 and so on. This is saying it's just the product of n independent functions. And that's what this graph is saying, the fact that there are no edges connecting any of the x's to each other, that they're only, once I know theta that I can predict all the x's, that's, that's what gives rise to this. This is such a common structure that there's a special notation for it, it's called a plate. So if I put a node or a set of nodes in a box and indicate a number of repetitions, that tells me that there's, uh, I should make n independent copies of that block. And if there's an arrow coming in, that's asserting that these things are conditionally independent given the thing that's, the stuff that's out of the block. So um, this, for this, this graph, a graph in a probabilistic graphical model is a description of the structure of the joint distribution. This graph is telling you that the joint distribution looks like this. There's a, there's a node with no incoming arrows, that's P of theta, and then there are N independent nodes, conditionally independent given theta, so those enter as just a product of N separate functions P of X. This graph doesn't tell you what these functions are. It just tells you th that your model has this structure. And then to find the posterior for theta, you just divide the joint distribution by the prior predictive distribution. But as I've, I've said repeatedly, that's just proportional to this uh, joint distribution. OK. Um, so let's do one example of uh, showing this conditional independence in this case this uh, common, common effects case. So I'm going to imagine flipping a coin n times and getting some number of heads n1. And then I'm going to do it again, flip the coin n times and get some number of heads n2. And as long as nothing fishy is going on, uh, causally those outcomes are independent. right? The, whether I get success uh, on the second flip on the first set of flips doesn't influence whether I'm going to get a success on the, the, the tenth flip on the next set of flips. There's no causal connection, but as we'll see, there can be inferential connections depending on what you know or don't know. So suppose we do this, we do these flips so that we know n1, but now we want to predict n2. What will be the number of heads that come up in my next 20 flips or however many we do. So suppose we know, either from some physical analysis or maybe from some previous measurements, we know the probability of heads. Maybe it's a half. Maybe you're convinced it's a fair coin flip. Um, so you, if you know alpha, then you know what this distribution is. It's the, this is the binomial distribution setup, right? So there's a probability for little n heads and big n flips and I'm asserting alpha is 0.5. So the probability for getting n2 successes in the second set of flips doesn't depend on the number of successes I got the first time, if I know alpha, um, because there's no causal connection. Um, and we, we, that happens because, uh, uh, I think I draw the graph on the next slide, yeah, because uh, n1 and n2 are conditionally independent given alpha. So how does that end up showing here? Let me show you here. So this is not a two-dimensional joint distribution. The black lines are to show you that I'm showing uh, a, a, a series of distributions. So for every possible 
number of heads I could get in 20 flips the first time. This is showing you the probability distribution for the number of heads that I would get the second time if I know that alpha is a half. And it's just the same distribution for no matter how many heads I got the first time. If I'm convinced that the coin flipping is fair, the, the probability distribution for the second set of flips is unaffected. Okay. Um, so that's, uh, that's what's, this graph is describing that situation. Alpha is shaded because I'm assuming here that I know it. N1 is known because I'm assuming that I've flipped the coin the first set of times and my goal was to predict N2. Um, and this is just using this, this graph to write down the joint distribution. So there's a P of alpha, P of N1 given alpha, P of N2 given alpha, but not given N1. Um, my predictive distribution for N2, uh, given all these known quantities, is just, uh, I just wrote it out as, as the joint divided by the knowns. And you can go through some algebra, which we don't really have time to go through, but you can, you can actually show that it doesn't depend on N1. So if you know alpha, you can predict the second set of, of outcomes. Your prediction for the second set of outcomes is independent of the first set. But what happens when you don't know alpha? Um, you're not convinced that the coin flipping is fair. Well, in that case, the first set of flips tells you something about alpha. So even though it doesn't causally influence the outcome of the second set of flips, it influences your predictions because it's telling you something about the, un the uncertain process that are generating the flips. So. Um, P of N2 given N1, but not given alpha. So alpha is no longer known. What would that look like? Well, we can use the law of total probability. Suppose we knew alpha, so I'll insert alpha, but then I'll integrate it out. So the law of total probability says I should factor this thing, so I'll have a P of alpha given N1. Well, that will be my posterior for alpha from the first set of flips, and then P of N2 Given alpha, this is just the binomial distribution. This is what I would say about N2 if I knew alpha, but I'm admitting that I don't know alpha by inserting it and marginalizing. So this just shows you what those predictive distributions look like. If I put a flat prior on alpha, the probability distribution for N2 peaks at whatever value N1 was. This is kind of, the, in some sense, roughly speaking, the most non-committal case. So if I saw zero heads the first time, it predicts I'll see zero heads the second time. Because I'm saying I don't know anything about alpha. If I saw zero heads, then alpha is probably really small. If I saw 15 heads the first time, it's predicting that I'll, I'm most likely to see 15 heads the second time. On the other hand, maybe it looked like a fair coin. You saw that it was heads. You didn't see me do anything fishy, but you weren't convinced that it it was absolutely fair. So you might express that by putting a prior in your Bayesian calculation that said, um, I'm pretty sure it's fair, but it might be within 10% of being fair at your coin flipping. So I would, that would come into this posterior by having a prior that has this uh, location and width. Um, it would partly ameliorate the information conveyed by little n1. So here's what that predictive set of predictive distributions look like under this prior. So it's, I put in fairly strong prior information, but my prediction for N2 is still affected by N1. It's not as affected in this case. If I see zero flips the first time, I'm now no longer predicting I'll see zero the next time, but my, uh, my uh, most probable value is shifted down from what it would have been a priori. All right, so what you've seen here is that um, the graph indicates kind of the causal structure of what's going on. Something about the coin tells me, lets me predict the different outcomes. Um, but the flow of information can go against the graph. If alpha is unknown, in this case, this node is unshaded, uh, learning N1 tells me about alpha. And as a result, the prediction for N2 does depend on N1. Even though there's no, arrow, no path of arrows connecting them, the information flow uh, can flow against the arrows. Basically, 
Um, because alpha affects the predictions of N1, learning N1 tells me something about alpha, and then that affects my predictions of N2. Um, and this is just the math for that. So if you don't mind for just a couple of minutes, I'll just do one more quick example where you'll now see this in an actual hierarchical model. So, um, so now suppose we have a population of, of coins and flippers. So maybe it's people flipping coins from a mint that produces somewhat biased coins, but each coin has a slightly different bias. So we imagine there's a mint and there's some distribution that tells you something about the asymmetry of the coins of that mint. And we, we're gonna have a bunch of people flipping coins to learn about what you know, is, are the coins always biased towards a bit towards heads or are they always nearly fair but with a certain width about being fair? So we're trying to learn that about um, the mint. So what can we learn about the population of coins by looking at results of a bunch of flips? So now we're drawing a, a graph that looks like our measurement error problems from before. So there's going to be some parameters that describe the, the mint and the biases of the coins it produces. Um, once I know that distribution, there's now a probability that I'll have a, a certain bias for coin one, a different bias for coin two, and so on for big N coins. And then I'm going to flip each coin a different number of times. We'll do this in a simulation in a second. And I'm going to get a certain number of heads uh, out of each coin. And so from that, I'm going to try to learn all the unknowns here. I'll try to learn uh, what, are, what is the true bias of each coin, and then what is the distribution of biases from the mint. So this graph tells me the structure of the model. It says, so here's a joint distribution for all the a priori unknowns. This is saying there's some uh, possible biases that are going to be described by some parameters with like a center and a width. That's the thetas. Once I know that, then I know uh, the probability for getting different possible biases for any individual coin. And once I know that coin's bias, then independently of the other coins, I have a, a binomial, what's going to be a binomial distribution for its number of heads. This is the thing that I called the uh, member likelihood function. Once I see a number of heads, all that I care about is how this thing uh, depends on alpha. And so that's why I've created this simpler notation here. So this is, uh, once you see this graph, now you can see why these are called hierarchical models. There's a hierarchy in the parameters that are appearing here. There's a top level, a middle level, a bottom level. So the term hierarchical model usually refers to models that have at least three levels like this. And there's some terminology. So um, th these are called the, the parameters or the latent parameters for the members of the population. And these are called the hyperparameters. This distribution, so the, expressing my uncertainty and what the mint's biases might be. The, so the prior for this is called the hyperprior. So the distribution for the alphas acts like a prior for the, the, the the, and each uh, member's data analysis, and then this is a prior for those. This is a prior for the thing that determines that distribution. Um, yes. If you had some parameters, so suppose theta is this vector, and some of the elements of that vector they're affecting the uh, distribution of n1 through nn, but not through alpha1 through alpha n. Would you then draw? So you have arrows coming from here down to here. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, if the parameters influenced both of these. Maybe some set of the parameters actually only influences these, so you'd have another node with that group of the parameters. I might draw it down here uh, going with arrows going over to here. You do so, I, I haven't seen things like that in astronomy, but if you look in the AI literature where these things are called Bayesian networks, you do see graphs that have that kind of structure too. So where you would have some other variables that maybe directly influence these, but not through the alphas. I guess I'm thinking of a case of a normal hierarchical model where you have uh, separate means for each mm -hmm. one 
Okay. Standard deviation. Uh, yeah. yeah. So then you could just have sigma down here. Uh, if sigma were unknown, you would include it in the graph and you would have it down here and that would just point to these. Is the fact that the sigma is separate from the theta, does that imply the prior would be independent? Yes. So if, you th if there was a joint prior, then you would have to keep it in here. Okay. And I don't think there's any... I, well, not necessarily. So, so suppose, let's, let's actually draw an example like that. So we're kind of getting a little off topic. But so you could do that like this. You could have. This class isn't ending, I think, right? Uh, no, we have until uh, six. Uh, oh, I think we're over now. No, no. It sounds like this class ends till 17. So that's as long as you want in reality. Yeah, that's not yeah. true. Yeah. <laughs> So we're allowed to go. I thought we were already late. Uh, so. No, typically I run until uh, 6.30. Okay. Uh, and then, but technically the class runs until 7.15. Yeah, I believe it's 7.15. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. so if you had mu and sigma, right? Yeah. So that, that means there's a joint distribution, right? But you can always factor this at, as, you know, maybe it, you have it as p of mu, p of sigma given mu, or uh, p of sigma, p of mu given sigma. Um, if you could always factor it one of those ways or another. So, but if one of those were particularly natural to the problem, then the way you could do what you just described is have mu, you would have um, the x's, so yeah, so you have the x's, no, sorry, you do, you want to do normal, normal inference, so there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of mu's, mu i, then there's a bunch of measurements, x i, there's a plate for those, n of them. And then there's some uh, mean for the, the mu's. I don't know what to call it. Let's call it nu. Um, uh, nu. That determines the distribution for the mu's. Um, so I don't know if the sigma you're thinking of was the sigma for the noise or the sigma for the distribution of the means. I guess I was thinking sigma for the noise. Uh, so that would, so there would normally be some kind of, you know, width for the distribution of the mu's as well, and then there would be some other sigma for the noise that would be going here. And so there could be if the sigma, so if the sigma were the same for all of them, it would have to be outside of the plate like this. Mm -hmm. If the sigma were allowed to vary with each of them, then it would have to be inside the plate, and it could have an arrow either coming or going to the mu's if you wanted those to be linked. Okay. So then it would be in the plate. I'm not sure what kind of structure you have in mind, but you could do it something like that. You'd have to pick one direction or the other according to what's the most natural way to factor the joint. Does that kind of uh, make sense? Yeah, yeah that, I guess I was thinking where the, there's a single mu, so the plate was uh, um, and, then, um, and if you want a dependent prior for mu, delta, and sigma, you'd have to have a line going from mu, delta, to sigma. So you might have, I mean, th that could happen, yeah. I mean, there's all, I'd have to hear more about the problem that you have in mind to know which, what graph it would actually correspond to. But yeah. Can I ask a more uh, concrete question? Mm -hmm. So um, one of, so I, I'm teaching an astrophysics class in parallel with this one from a considerably less informed point of view. <laughs> um, and so my students are doing projects, and one of the projects that they're doing, uh, we think is hierarchical Bayesian modeling, but now I'm starting to get worried. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if PyScan's going to be up for this. So, so what 
what we thought was maybe a high span length problem, um, but maybe it has too many interdependences, um, is that the um, Tully Fisher relation, which is, mm -hmm. again, just to remind everyone, the luminosity versus velocity relation, um, has um, implicit in it um, a, a, an equation that relates the shape as observed of a galaxy to its inclination to your line of sight. Um, and so that relation between the shape and the inclination is usually assumed, but it could be measured. Um, it has, it's, it, the most common form of it is a single parameter relation, and the single parameter, roughly speaking, represents the intrinsic shape of an edge-on galaxy. So, um, so the problem that we are trying to do as a hierarchical modeling problem, but I'm a little worried, um, is basically... No, it sounds um, the right track. We, we are saying that the, uh, the top level population parameter is, is um, the alpha, if, if uh, sorry, oh no, that's gonna be really confusing. I won't say alpha, but sorry. It, it's, the, it's this shape parameter mm -hmm. um, that, that relates observed shape to inclination. Um, and then the, um, the way that we're gonna um, figure out the, uh, and so then there's not, I don't know if it maps exactly right onto this because there's not independent measurements. Because what happens is as soon as you assume a particular um, intrinsic shape parameter, then that moves all the data points in the Tully Fisher relation. So now you have mm -hmm. a different distribution of data points because they all moved because all their inclinations got reassigned. And now you do a fit, which is, you know, I mean, you could just do the analytic, you know, ordinary least squares fit. So it's not like you have to run a code or anything. Mm -hmm. um, and that defines all the residuals from the fit, and then you, you use all those residuals that you've defined to calculate a likelihood. Um, and so the concept was that we were gonna basically um, try to use pi stand to do this, but now I'm thinking because at the bottom level, our data, they all move together. Like every time we choose mm -hmm. that, that parameter in the equation, yeah, that's still the, the fit that's moves, right because the, re, the but that's, residuals relative that's what it sounds. I mean, we we should sit down and try to write out a graph for it. But it sounds like what you're describing is exactly conditional independence. Like, so if you know i, that makes everything shift. Right. Right. Changing i makes everything shift. But once i is known, then everything is yeah, in the, place. Then the fit moves. The residuals right. get defined. Right. And the likelihoods all get defined. So I think you're fine. I think. You think I think. Will do this? Okay, like, it sounds like the it. Data are, they're not quite like so like that. there's a parameter here. That's the well. We'll go. We'll we'll go through the example in a minute. But it's it's where the uh, where the the bias of the mint is, right? And as that parameter moves, it shifts the predictions of all these data. You know, if 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 I if I think the mint is producing coins biased to heads, then it shifts the probability distributions of all the things. It shifts all the, the alpha distributions all the way to the right. It shifts all the n distributions all to higher values of n. Okay, but, so I but I can learn it. You know, the thing is, I don't know where that is. So um, I think what you're saying, mathematically speaking, is that if I write down the ordinary least squares fit just as algebra, because we know that can be done algebraically, mm -hmm. if I write down the algebraic least squares fit and treat all the data points as fixed, because they're not changing, um, only the inclination. Then I can write that fit as product as a function of this parameter. Right. Okay. Cool. I think you're okay that way. Awesome. Okay. All right. So, um, so this is to, to make the point why these things are called hierarchical Bayesian models. There's a hierarchy, right? Um, if there's more than two levels, or even if there's two levels, it's hierarchical technically. Um, whether to call this a two-level or a three-level model is a bit, sometimes people count levels by the, the levels, the number of levels with open nodes. So they, some people might call this a two-level model. Some people just count the, the, the numbers of all, the, the, count the levels of all the nodes. So this would be called a three-level model. So there's some ambiguity in that part of the language. But the point is there's multiple levels. Normal basis theorem looks like this. Um, hierarchical models add one or more levels like this. And they can get very complicated, like uh, in sociology they've become particularly 
complicated, I and mean, Stan is built by a sociologist, where there would be groups and groups of groups, you know, so there would be like, you might model the political behavior of people, voters in, in, the, the, in the US, you know, Andrew Gelman, the, the, the PI behind Stan worries about this kind of thing, so you might break it down into states and then counties and states and assuming that people have similar political proclivities depending on whether they're in the same county or not. And so they have these models that have hierarchies of groups that themselves have hierarchies. So, um, so these models can become very rich very quickly. And in astronomy, there are some very rich ones. Probably the most complicated ones are done by Casey Mandel, who's downstairs, or, or was a half hour ago, an hour ago. All right, so remember, these graphs tell you the way this thing factors. They tell you the structure of the model, but not, they don't tell you what these functions are. Um, once you've used your understanding of the, the causal processes on, in your model or the, um, to, to come up with a structure like this, now you have to start assigning distributions to these things. So in this coin example, remember, this describes the, the the biases that come out of the mint, these are the actual biases, and then these are the data. So each one of these things is a, a, a represents a probability distribution that we'll have to assign. So theta will be the dis parameters that describe the distribution of um, biases out of the mint. So it's a distribution for the head probabilities. So I show it on the next slide, but just to, to show it here. So there, there might be something that looks like this, zero to one, maybe a half is here. So this would be a distribution that says the, the coins actually have a wide range of probabilities for heads and they tend to be biased towards tails. This is alpha, this is alpha. And so there'd be some parameters that describe this like the mean, let's call it mu, and some kind of width, let's call that sigma. So um, this top node would be the parameters that describe that bias distribution, so mu and sigma. And I, the node means there's a probability distribution over those. That's the prior, or the hyper prior, rather. And so uh, for the example we'll do here, we'll just pick something simple. We'll just pick a flat distribution over the possible locations between 0 and 1, and a flat distribution for sigma. Um, I'm waving my hands a little bit there, but um, so then once I know those, I actually have to assume a shape for this distribution, and the shape I'm going to assume is something called a beta distribution. It's just uh, the beta distribution is proportional. Wait, so if alpha are called parameters and theta are called hyperparameters, then what are mu and sigma? So theta, mu and sigma are theta. So they are theta. Yes. Theta here is two-dimensional, it's a mu and sigma. So those are the hyperparameters. Or the population parameters is the way I like to think of them here. So th those are the parameters that describe the population distribution. Um, and these are the latent parameters. These are the success probabilities for each of the coins. And we're assuming a shape for the population distribution. That's this beta, this unimodal smooth thing. And the beta distribution is just something that's, pro I'm using alpha, so it's proportional to alpha to some power, is it a minus one, one minus a, I always forget, yeah, a minus one, yeah, one minus alpha to the b minus one. It's just a power of alpha and a power of one minus alpha. That is a family of distributions that look like this. So could the um, mu and sigma have instead, like if you just created a histogram, P of alpha, mm -hmm. could they have just been the heights of the different histogram names? So it's yes. directly mappable onto a probability mm -hmm. distribution? Mm -hmm. if, I, if I specify uh, mu and sigma, I can get A and B or, back, or backwards. You know, once I pick these two numbers, that determines the mean of this. So I could... There's actually a formula that I could have written this in terms of mean and sigma. It's just messier than that formula. Um, all right, so I'm going to choose these as my hyperparameters, flat prior, a beta distribution here, and a binomial distribution here. 
So this is the structure, these are the actual forms. This is the qualitative uh, f form of the model, and this is the actual quantitative assignments that we'll make. So um, I'm just going to go through some pictures that show you, this is sometimes called a generative model, uh, more than sometimes, often called a generative model. It's, it's a model that kind of gives you a probabilistic picture of how you generate data. That's where that name comes from. Technically, what it means is a model that expresses the probability for everything in the problem, the data and any unknown parameters. So it's saying there's a probability. It's kind of the picture of how data are generated is that somebody picks a mint. The mint produces a distribution of biases. And then each of those coins is flipped, and it produces a number of heads. So that's the data generating process, or DGP, is described by a graphical model. So this plot is a, shows you one realization of that, that generative model, that data generating process, just done in a, some code on Python using random number generators. So I chose a particular value of mu and sigma. I could have chose it randomly from a prior. I think I set it by hand. I, I couldn't remember what. But there's one value of those that's set. So those specify this blue distribution, describes how the mint produces biased coins. From that, I drew, I forget how many, I think was 20 values of alpha for the biases of 20 coins. Those are these dots here. And for the sake of uh, plotting things legibly, I've picked five of them to track throughout the next few slides. Those are the blue diamonds. So here's one uh, that had a uh, fairly small value of alpha. I flipped that coin 80 times, and I got 20 heads in the computer. Right? So this green histogram is the binomial distribution. And the red slot of it is just the number shows the number of heads that I got for that particular coin when I used the random number generator. So this one had about a 34% chance of heads. I flipped that one 40 times instead of 80. I got 16 uh, heads. This one I only flipped 10 times, so it has a, a relatively broad um, binomial distribution for the number of heads. I only got one head out of 10 flips, I expected about three and a half, and so on, OK? All right, so this is the data generating process. So now we have all the data. The data are just the locations of these red bins for, for all 20. And now what we'd like to do, or there's two possible things we might be interested in. We want to know the bias of each of the coins, or we want to make a guess of what this blue distribution is, since we don't. We don't know it if all we have is the data at the bottom. So we're going to try to do both of those problems. So on the next slide, I'm going to compute the member likelihood function. So what's the description of the uncertainty for the alpha of one particular coin? I'm going to do it for this coin here. So the true value of alpha was 0.45. That specified this green distribution. It's a discrete probability mass function, right? It's the binomial distribution for the integer n4. Now what I know is I saw 11 heads. I don't, and I know that I did 20 flips. I don't know alpha, so I need to come up with some description of my uncertainty for alpha for this coin. Okay, So that's what I do on the next slide. So compute the member likelihood function for that coin. 11 heads in 20 flips. So if alpha were 0.35, the binomial distribution would look like this green histogram. If it were 0.75, so that peaks at about you know, 7 out of 20, right? 0.35 times 20. Um, this one peaks at around, I don't know, 17, 16 if alpha was 0.75. So for each possible value of alpha, I'll draw the binomial distribution, but I'll evaluate it at the, the number 11, because that's the number of heads I actually got. So I'm asking for different choices of alpha, how well could I have predicted the, the actual one number of heads that I got in the number of flips that I tried? So for alpha of 0.35, I get this fairly low probability. That's this diamond here. For alpha of 0.45, um, 
I get a higher probability, so that's this diamond here, and so on. So I'm just kind of looking at all the different binomial distributions that could have produced this data, recording how probable they make this particular one datum. So that's the likelihood function. So remember, the sampling distribution, um, this thing down here, P versus N, that's a discrete distribution, a probability mass function for N. But alpha is a continuous parameter. Um, and what the likelihood function communicates is how uncertain we are in that. So the likelihood function is a continuous function of alpha. So astronomers like to, and physicists, we tend to use sloppy language. We might say, uh, sorry, on this slide. We might say, we might, the, the language we might use is instead of saying that I saw 11 heads, we might say, I saw 11 plus or minus 3 heads. But really, I saw 11 heads, right? The plus or minus 3 is trying to tell me something about the width of this function. Um, really, what I should be saying is I saw 11 heads. That means alpha should be about 11 over 20 plus or minus the square root of 11 over 20. You know, plus or minus, what is that, 3-ish, three, 3 over 20. So the uncertainty is in alpha. The uncertainty is in alpha, not n. So going back to the gamma ray burst thing we were talking about before, I look at gamma ray burst number 3. It dumped 100 photons into my photomultiplier. That's it. There's 100 photons. What I'm uncertain about is not the number of photons, it's what's the flux of the gamma ray burst that produced the 100 photons that I did actually count. The uncertainty is not the number of photons, the uncertainty is in the flux. So that's what the likelihood function does. The Poisson distribution would tell me that if the expected number of photons was 100, I would expect to see 100 plus or minus 10. That's the Poisson distribution for the number of photons. But now that I've seen 100, the likelihood function for the flux is that Poisson distribution, but looked at as a function of flux. So that's what's going on here. There's a binomial distribution for the number of heads. But the likelihood function is a function of the probability alpha. It's not a function of the number. I mean, it depend, the number of heads is fixed for that. And it defines this function. So we do that for all 20 coins. And that gives these red dotted curves down here. I only showed five of them again. This is the one we just computed. So once I know those likelihoods for alpha, now I know something about the alphas of the coins. You could imagine like taking, for example, the, the peaks of these and doing a histogram up here. Um, that would give me some kind of crude estimate for the distribution of alphas. Um, but then that should be acting as a prior for what my actual estimate of alpha is. So you could imagine this is something like what happens if you do this numerically. Um, you, you're picking an alpha according to this red curve. You're histogramming them. Then you're using that as a prior to modulate the red curve. It makes it look you know, push it more towards the center of the distribution and you can go back and forth. So there's this kind of feedback process between inferring the alphas and inferring the populations. That's what I'm trying to indicate with these double arrows. So um, all the, the math that we talked about earlier where you write down that joint distribution and you integrate over the alphas, that accomplishes all this analytically if you can do it. When you do it by Monte Carlo, you actually do something like this feedback process. But anyway, so it, you can get two things out of this. You can get uh, posterior distributions for each coin's alpha. Those are the green things here. In fact, there's a joint distribution for all of them, but I've shown you the, the marginals for each one. And you get an estimated population distribution. Actually, you get a, you get a distribution of possible bias distribution. So I've shown the best fit one here as the green curve. The blue is dashed one. It was the unknown true one. And so I want to point out a few things here on the bottom level. So the likelihood functions from the binomial distribution were, remember, were these red dotted curves. The green curves are the posteriors once I've pooled together all the information from all the data. 
Um, I've normalized both of these. I mean, of course, the green curve has to be normalized. It's a posterior. The red curve is a likelihood function. It, it can have an arbitrary normalization, but I've normalized it to be one. So when, this, when one of these curves is higher than the other, that also means it's narrower because they have unit area. Okay. So what you, two things you should see about the difference between the red and the green curves here. One is that there's, there tends to be a shift towards the center of this distribution. This distribution is centered around 0.4. Um, this one, the, the red curve peaked to the left of 0.4, so my posterior estimate actually gets pushed a little towards 0.4. Um, this one, the red peaked to the right of 0.4, and it, the posterior pushed it towards the center. That's that shrinkage that we were talking about earlier. Um, if I were just to look independently at each uh, number of heads, I would get some set of estimates, which I'll show in a slide or two. But once I pool together uh, all the data and, and, and claim that they all came from the same mint and from a population so that they're related through this beta distribution, that brings all the estimates together. But maybe the more surprising thing should be that the green curves are all higher than the red ones. That means they're all narrower. That means um, not only have I shifted the estimates, but I'm also claiming that the estimates are more precise. Um, there's less uncertainty. It's because I'm bringing to bear on the first coin, not only the evidence from its flips, but the knowledge that it came from a population that I know about from the flips of all the other coins. It's that borrowing of strength. Um, so that's that's what that term is usually used for in the literature. It, it's used to explain the fact that your estimates increase in precision when you take into account that something is a member of a population that you have information about. Um, so that's a, a cool and non-trivial effect. Uh, yeah. So on this slide, the red dot, dotted are the likelihood functions? That's right. Okay. So you, uh, does that look similar to what the posterior would look like if you just computed a posterior for that single coin toss? Uh, Only if you had a flat uh, bias distribution, right? So the distribution of the biases is playing the role of the prior for each coin's alpha. Right? If I say the mint tends to produce fair coins, um, then if I happen to have a coin with a small fraction of heads, I tend to think that that coin is, that that was just a fluke. That was just a, a statistical thing, if I believe that the coin came from a mint that tends to produce heads. So I'll tend to shift my estimate for its bias up a little bit. So the likelihood would only be the posterior if the prior were flat. So only, uh, only if I were completely agnostic about the mint you know, would that happen. I guess I'm trying to think about what the Bayesian analysis would be if you just pretended you only had this one coin. So then you would yeah, it would all then that would depend on the hyper prior, right? That's right. So you could integrate over the top. You can integrate the hyper prior. If I if I integrate, so there's a beta distribution that's a function of, so there's p of alpha given mu and sigma, right? P of alpha sub i, right? But I have a prior for mu and sigma, so there's there's a p of alpha sub i, which is, if I don't know, if, I, if there's only one coin, that's the integral d mu, integral d sigma of my prior for mu and sigma of this thing. So this is a beta distribution. If this prior were, you know, exactly what this integral will look like depends, will depend a lot on the hyper prior. So if you compute it, if you use this prior for each coin and analyze each coin separately, you would get a curve? No. Um, because, so this is assuming there's no other, uh, right? So if the, this, is, this is the prior for alpha 1, right? Yeah. So if there were only one coin, then the posterior for alpha 1 would be its prior 
uh, times its likelihood function. But if there are many coins, there's a joint prior for all of them, and they all become correlated. Mm -hmm. to just the likelihood function, which is the red mm -hmm. constant. So uh, uh, there's kind of a third line you could draw there, which is the uh, Bayesian approach if you just use that one coin. <coughs> and would, uh, would that be between? You mean the, Bayesian with a non-flat prior? So, yeah. remember, so the way that I'm getting this, roughly speaking, it's not exactly right, but the way I'm getting this green curve from this red curve is by multiplying the red curve by this green curve and normalizing. This is the population distribution that I've inferred from all my coins. And so it shifts, it acts as a prior for each coin, and it shifts it towards the population mean. Right? If I only had one coin, um, there would only be prior information determining the population. There's no population, right? There's, there's only prior information. So if the prior information were something strong, like this green curve, then it would shift it. But if it were flat, then it wouldn't. Does that, I don't know if, maybe we should write down the equations or whatever. But, all right, so, um, so here are the true alphas. So remember here again are those red curves and green curves. Um, here are the maximum likelihood estimates, so the peaks of these binomial likelihood functions. And you can see they're somewhat spread out because they're noisy measurements of the true ones. So there's something like a convolution going on. This is the root mean squared error between the maximum likelihood estimates and the truth. Here are the peaks of the, the green curves, the marginal posteriors, and you can see they have almost half the error, the root mean squared error, of the maximum likelihood points. So you really gained a lot by analyzing everything together, taking account of the fact that they were from a population. Um, where does that kind of graph come from? This kind, where does this kind these, of? These dots on the line, like this. What do you mean, where does it come from? Is that an output of Python? Or? Oh, no, it's just some Python code I wrote. It's not a standard no, thing. You see some things like that in the shrinkage literature, but other than that, I don't think. I just made three axes and connected them. It was it's actually a little bit of a pain in the neck, but in well, Python. Well, at first I thought you were showing the batting averages just for an analogy, but then I realized no. it's actually. Yeah, it's actually this uh, simulation. Um, so just a bit of terminology. Um, Hierarchical Bayes refers to taking into account all the uncertainties in the problem by marginalizing. So if you want um, to estimate the alphas, you would do it by multiplying together all the distributions for everything, integrating over all of them. Um, that's doing so-called hierarchical Bayesian inference. An approximation is called empirical Bayes. What that corresponds to is kind of what I was describing on the previous slide. So, I don't actually know what precisely what the population distribution is. I have a, a, a distribution over distributions, right? It could have been this green curve or it could have been a, a curve slightly different from it. I have a probability that it's this green curve, a probability that it's one a little to the left, a little to the right. Um, this marginalization in a hierarchical Bayesian calculation takes into account your uncertainty in the population distribution, it propagates that down to the lower level. Um, empirical Bayes just picks a best fit green curve here, maybe by just you know taking all these dots and doing some kind of maximum likelihood calculation or something. Just picks one green curve at the top, uses it as a prior for all the red curves at the bottom. Um, that's called empirical Bayes. It's uh, a lot simpler to do computationally. It doesn't have as quite as good properties, even from the frequentist point of view. Um, but anyway, that's just language you'll hear. So, I mean, that's my description of it. So, empirical Bayes actually can be viewed as a, a whole, there's a whole frequentist literature on it, just viewed as a kind of a frequentist procedure. There's a lot that could be said about it. If, but from a Bayesian point of view, it's just an approximation to hierarchical Bayes. All right, now I want to make one subtle but important point. Um, 
Am I doing it on this slide or the next slide? Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah, let's do it. All right, this is actually stuff I already said. Um, all right, so from the frequentist point of view, these point estimates from those green curves are biased estimators. The peaks of the maximum likelihood curves, actually those sometimes are biased too, but um, these are generally are biased. However, they're still good, even from the frequentist point of view. You might recall that the, the uh, error in an estimate is or the squared error is the sum of the bias squared plus the variance squared. So if I have an estimator and I apply it many times to a problem, um, the center of those estimates might be shifted from the truth, but um, I have to worry not just about the center of the estimates, but also about the width. So um, the, the average error I'll make is the sum in quadrature. The squared average error is the sum in quadrature of the shift, the bias, and the width. And what happens in these kinds of hierarchical Bayesian calculations is you introduce a small amount of bias, but you do it with a substantial reduction in the variance. So as a result, the error decreases even though the bias increases, the expected error increases. So they're seen as a good thing to do even from the frequentist point of view. Um, so this is all lingo that we already talked about. Um, all right, so this is the subtle point. Um, so this is the same plot I showed you before. The true alphas, the um, independent maximum likelihood values that are over dispersed, and then the, uh, the hierarchical Bayes or empirical Bayes point estimates, the peak of each of those marginal posteriors. Now suppose I would try to use um, the maximum likelihood estimates to estimate the bias distribution. Suppose I took, you know, if I saw 11 heads in in 20 flips. Suppose I treated that coin as if it had a bias exactly 11 over 20. I didn't take into account the uncertainty. If, and then I tried to find what's the beta distribution that fits this distribution of red dots. That's this red curve here. That's just saying what we've already noticed and said before. If you ignore the uncertainties, you tend to estimate a population distribution that's over dispersed compared to the true one, which is the blue one. Now, the bottom are these point estimates from the uh, empirical or hierarchical Bayes that we've said already are much nicer in terms of having better root mean squared error. Now, let's suppose those were precise estimates, and let's use those to estimate the population distribution. Those give this dashed green curve here, which now you see is under dispersed compared to the truth. In fact, uh, I didn't show it here, but um, if you compute the difference between these distributions by a standard metric, the kublak leibler divergence, we don't have to get into it, but in, by some measures, this, the, the distribution, the population distribution using these point estimates is farther from the truth than the red, than one based on the red ones. So what's going on with that? I mean, the Bayesian estimate, the full hierarchical estimate was this green curve here, which is pretty close to the blue curve, why is using these point estimates giving this, which came from the Bayesian calculation, giving this much narrower under dispersed result? It's because I've ignored the fact that each of these still has uncertainty, less uncertainty than these had, but they still have uncertainty, and moreover, they're all correlated with each other. Um, this solid green curve accounts for all of that. It's an, it's, that's why what, why you need codes like PyStand to do all that. It's basically integrating over this 20-dimensional correlated distribution um, by Monte Carlo. Um, but the point of this is that you shouldn't use point estimates ever to compute population distributions. If you use the raw point estimates, you'll be over-dispersed. But if you use improved point estimates, like doing something like Malmquist bias corrections in astronomy or in this case, uh, shrinkage estimators or hierarchical Bayesian estimators, you can be under, uh, under dispersed um, if you treat them as if they were precise. Because there's still uncertainty, and it's now narrower marginally, but it's also more complicated because they're all correlated. So beware of point estimates. OK, so I think at this point we can stop the one thing. That's what I already said. One thing I want to mention is here's, 
here's a graph that's the structure we just looked at. Remember, this was a dis this was a parameters describing a mint biases. Well, think of these now as parameters describing the power law index and the cutoff of a Schechter function. These were the alphas, the biases of coins. Think of them now as the fluxes of galaxies or luminosities of galaxies. And then the observed data, imagine you have a photon counting detector doing photometry. So you have a Poisson distribution for counts. I'm ignoring background here. So um, everything we just described kind of has a one-to-one -one mapping to looking, inferring um, uh, number counts distributions or log n log s distributions. Um, in terms of its structure, it's no more complicated than this problem we just did. And um, I have a link, I think I didn't put it in the slides, but there's a, I have a stand script that does this calculation. This, so this is Schechter distribution, well, it's called a gamma distribution by statisticians. Um, Poisson distributed photon Is counts. Gamma? Hmm? Yeah, I'm, I'm waving my hands a little. So um, this is the one thing that the statisticians might not know in this entire two hour talk. Sorry about that. Um, so there are these MP distributions that astronomers like to use for the brightnesses or luminosities of things. And uh, P of like the luminosity of galaxies, they'll write it as proportional to luminosity to some power. Sometimes they'll write it with a negative sign. Let's just write it alpha P to the minus L over L star. Um, so, if alpha is bigger than minus one, uh, then this thing is a gamma distribution. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, it's a gamma distribution with a shape parameter that's like one bigger than alpha or something, one yeah. less, one less? Uh, alpha minus one is Yeah, the yeah, so. Um, the thing is that astronomers tend to use this without, so this is called a Schechter func function. But with arbitrary alpha. Yeah, so as, most of the cases where astronomers use this are with alpha. So when alpha is bigger than one, the reason there's this constraint is that when alpha By is- bigger than, do you mean absolute value or? No, I mean, you mean more alpha percentage. larger than minus one. The reason that this is important is because the integral dl of p of l um, is proportional to a, a gamma function. Actually, yeah, uh, alpha plus one or minus one, I forget one. Um, but uh, when alpha is less than negative one, this integral diverges. So this is no longer a PDF. Uh, astronomers are, the, almost all the interesting cases in astronomy, um, this is, are almost all have, have alpha in the interval of minus two to minus one. <laughs> so they diverge, so they're not PDFs. But uh, remember this is, a distribution for luminosities, you don't see the dim galaxies. Your survey can't see the very dimmest galaxies because you can only see galaxies brighter than some detection limit. So astronomers don't care that you can't integrate this down to zero because they're always truncating. So there's, there's some lower limit, there has to be physically a, a lower limit to this distribution and astronomers just ignore that um, and so it's, so it's not quite fair to say that a, the Schechter function is the gamma distribution because the Schechter function is, it's only a legitimate choice if there's an additional parameter, if there's some low cutoff that's never specified because it's below some detection limit. Um, so it's not quite legitimate to say it's a gamma distribution, but they are proportion, it's proportional to it what would be a gamma distribution for some choices of the power law index. It's the same functional form, but in a regime that's improper. 
meaning not normalizable. So power law with a cutoff. So, so astronomers are interested in this negative case. So if you were to plot this in log log space, So astronomers tend to plot log P versus log L. And this, in the regime of interest, this looks like this. So this is a slope alpha. And then there's an exponential cutoff. This would be L star. So we tend to think of this as a, a, power law, a falling power law with a cutoff. That's the Schechter function. Uh, statisticians look at this in the, the case of alpha being bigger than minus 1. and They don't pl plot it in log log space. They plot it like this. And the gamma distribution, um, except for negative, they al it's almost always for positive alpha. So for alpha bigger than 0, it's a rising power law and then an exponential cutoff. So. Um, the regime where alpha is between minus 1 and 0 actually does look like this. Um, but that's usually never of interest to statisticians. They're always interested in this functional form when alpha is a positive number, so things look like a rising power law and then an exponential curve. So this is, this is Schechter, this is gamma regimes of the same functional form. But anyway, so. Um, the gamma distribution, if you do restrict yourself to rising power laws or power laws that don't fall more steeply than minus 1, then you can use Stan's gamma distribution and you can do uh, log n log s fitting like this. Um, and you get, this is a result from a Stan script that I put on GitHub that you guys can download and, and run. Um, it includes the Python code for doing plots like this um, if, you, if they're of interest to you. And so this looks a lot like the plot I just showed you, but it's now for um, something roughly resembling you know, a number counts estimate. So there's a, a flux distribution, true fluxes, maximum likelihood fluxes, <clears throat> now from a Poisson distribution instead of a binomial distribution, and then shrunken estimates, so for a multi-level model. Anyway, so I think we should stop there. There are just a few slides on Monte Carlo methods left, but. That's it. Thank you for hanging in there. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I have a question. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the, <clears throat> the um, maximum likelihood is unbiased. And so, in general, even with simple problems, maximum likelihood is biased. It's, biased. Okay. it's consistent, so it's asymptotically unbiased. So, you, you, you have uh, a lot of data, so you can get a more. Uh, consistent. Uh, yeah. So let me let me make so one. I, my question is, uh, can you use the um, maximum likelihood estimate to create the bias list, the, the bias list of the bias estimate? Yeah. So, so in so there are conditions for which the maximum likelihood estimate is consistent, um, and one of the conditions is that the parameter space has fixed dimension. So um, if you're doing parametric inference, like uh, <clears throat> so say I have some distribution like this, and I measure precise values of the x's, so um, xi is like that. So, so then my likelihood function for theta is the, the product of over i's of the f of x i's given theta. Then, um, and then theta hat is um, arg max L of theta right, over theta. Um, so when you're in this setting, uh, theta hat will generally be biased but it will be consistent so that as, as n goes to infinity, it will converge in the right sense to, to the true value. But in these problems, the number of parameters isn't just theta, it's also when you have measurement error, there's also a latent parameter for each datum. 
So the size of the parameter space is actually growing as the sample size grows. Every new gamma ray burst I get brings in its own new flux parameter. So the kind of fun and tricky thing about these problems is that maximum likelihood estimation is not only biased but inconsistent for these for measurement error problems. In general, with measurement error problems, maximum likelihood gives you the wrong answer, even with infinite data. Um, and it's because each, each datum is bringing with it a new parameter, so you've broken the theorems that prove consistency assume a fixed, fixed size parameter space, and measurement error problems have a parameter space whose dimension grows with sample size. So, so, so it's not, I mean, that's not to say that you, sh you can't use maximum likelihood to do some things like initialize, find some parameters to initialize your MC, MC at, or something like that. But you can't rely, in general, it's just a dangerous thing to do when you have measurement error or any kind of hierarchical structure like this. It's inconsistent. So what is the notion of consistency when the dimension of the parameter space is increasing? So you would talk about consistency for theta. Um, I don't think, I don't even know how you could even think about consistency for the latent parameters because they're always coming in with noise. You could probably define different asymptotics. You could say, as sample size grows, imagine that the precision grows or the uncertainty in each measurement grows. There's probably some, you know, like in time series, there are different asymptotics for whether you use infill or, or outfill or, or whatever the, the other one's called. There's probably a regime of asymptotics where you could get maximum likelihood to work, but it's not one that corresponds to any real experiment. You know, real experiments, another object comes in with the same kind of uncertainty as the ones you've just looked at. Um, more technically than that, I just don't know the answer to your question. I don't know. I've never worked through the theorems that show the inconsistency that I just described for you. I just know the, the result. Is this the Scott problem? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, everything has the same mean. Uh, they're normally distributed, but for the pairs, the variance is changing. And, and so, so there. So I talk about the name and Scott problem in this paper and connect it to the because this stuff. Yeah. So, so it's the means that are different, and the sigmas are the same. Oh. Okay. But it's the same idea. You measure. The, in the paper, it's actually, I think it's the velocities of stars, oh. believe it or not. It's a paper, this is a famous paper. It's one of the early examples of failure of maximum likelihood. And it's called the Neyman Scott problem. And the paper was published in an econometrics journal, econometrica, I believe. But the example is from astronomy. Because Elizabeth Scott, Neyman's wife, a, a famous statistician in her own right, she was an astronomer. And they did a few important astrostatistics problems in the early 20th century. And so the example was actually from astronomy. It's a very important historical problem in statistics. Um, now you see that my girlfriend's anniversary and my brother and sister-in-law's, I have to remember. <clears throat> um, yeah. Uh, I, I have cards for them with me. Um, OK, any, any other questions? Any? Yeah. Sure. So it, this relates to the Schechter function that we were talking about before. So in the, uh, you have the hierarchical model at the end where you had the uh, gamma for the... Um, gamma, it's called the gamma Poisson. Yeah, the gamma Poisson. So there you're going to have um, conjugacy at the lower yeah. level. And so you could use uh, like a Gibbs sampler or something mm -hmm. once you fix the higher mm -hmm. level parameters. If you're actually in the Schechter... Uh, if, if the parameter for the Schechter function is less than uh, negative one, I right, guess, right. are you going to have to then not have conjugacy? And yes. Do something difficult. Yeah. Or? So even for this prop, like when I did it for this plot, this this plot's actually from years ago before there was a Stan. So I gave you a script that reproduces this with Stan, but I did this without Stan. And the way I do it, these problems when there's a low dimensional lower level is I actually numerically integrate over the x's and just with a quadrature rule. 
And uh, that doesn't care whether it's gamma or Schechter or whatever, you know, it's just doing it numerically. Um, and so now I only have a two-dimensional posterior for the shape of the gamma function or the Schechter function. And then I just, that two-dimensional, you don't even need MCMC, right? You don't. Um, uh, or you could do, you know, if it were higher dimensional, you could do it with MCMC, but you, uh, you integrate numerically over the lower dimensions. This is almost never done in Bayesian statistics, but um, I only discovered recently, I was trying to look for people doing things this way. Um, the anal one analog for these things in frequentist stat statistics are uh, mixed random effects models. Mixed effects models correspond to these models. But there's, there's kind of like a frequentist parallel literature on, on this stuff. And they do it by doing, thi they, by doing this. They solve their problems by doing this kind of numerical marginalization, or at least a lot of those people do. So that's, that. ironically, that's where I found this same approach. To me, it makes sense because when you use MCMC, you're doing integrals by Monte Carlo. And if I handed you an integral to do, that was two-dimensional or one-dimensional. If you knew about numerical methods, Monte Carlo would be at the bottom of your list, right? Because Monte Carlo, quadrature rules have much faster rates of convergence than Monte Carlo when you're below dimensions of three or four. Right? Um, so when you're doing these problems, because they're conditionally independent, you're essentially using Monte Carlo to do lots of one or two-dimensional integrals, and that just never made sense to me. Um, so that's why I've always been doing them this way. It's not obvious that it's better to do it this way because there are subtle things going on. There are, you know, it's conditionally independent. So you're not really, when you're doing them by MCMC, you're not really doing one dimensional integrals by Monte Carlo. But um, somebody should study this. It's something I've been meaning to try to study to figure out when one approach is better than the other. It's a function of dimension and complexity of the integrals. Guy who permanently appeared in people's organizing. Yeah. No. Um, Billy. Sorry? Bosch. Suji. 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 Um, didn't he send an email saying that he. Yeah, it turned out. I, I was all excited about that, but it turned out it wasn't this. Oh, okay. But the, the person who, here who has done this is David Stenning. So um, he's the first person I've seen in the Bayesian side of the literature. Um, and he's a statistician, not, not an astronomer, um, actually do this by quadrature over the lower level. Um, and he's, he he'd actually- Did he compare the two methods? Or he no, he just did it that way. Just seen he, with David Van Dyke. It's a good question because the person he worked with on this has always done it by MCMC. I never thought to ask him why, why did he change his mind for this problem? Um, that's a good question. And if they ever compared it, Anyway, but the, yeah, the main method is Metropolis within Gibbs, which I think you know about. So. Uh, great. All right, thank you, Tom. Okay. And, uh, <laughs>